my name is David, and I'm the founder of ActiveLoop. I'm super excited to be here at AI at Scale. And today, my presentation will be focused on training large visual models with Deep Lake. So I think all of you are already aware of that really to get a competitive advantage, you have to build the data flywheel. The data or the model is not enough. You have to iterate all this data, collect more um, information, how your users or consumers all of the model are operating on top and continuously improve, similar to what ChatGPT has been doing over the past few months, collecting user information, customer conversations, and then retraining the model to make it better. And whoever does the first, that's the mod the company takes with it while going into the kind of AI industry revolution here. So before getting started into focus on what's actually a visual model or what's a large language model, um, I want to talk briefly about what's a deep lake. So deep lake developed at our company is a data lake specialized for deep learning applications. So what it focused on is actually it's not doing an annotation, neither does training. It's focused on collecting your data, structuring it into a tensor storage format, making it keeping track of the version. So then later you can have a full data lineage how the data set has been trained on, being able to run queries on top, visualize the data set, and then once it's ready, stream to the training process. So it basically takes everything from raw data ingestion till the training part. It starts from the format itself. So we build a tensor storage format, which is very native to deep learning workloads. What you can do is you can take images, videos, audio, text data, convert them into n-dimensional array or what we call tensors, and then sort them on top of an object storage or file system very efficiently so that later you can stream the data set to the training process. One thing that it allows you to be better at is actually inspecting your data set and making sure that you don't have any bugs in your data. This is one of the key things when you train either a large uh, model or you fine tune that into your finding specific edge cases. Once the data set is in our format, then you can start building it around. And then you can start with an empty data set, create an image tensor, append maybe 100 image links. Yes, you can have both images inside the tensor storage format, or you can also have the pointers that point to your raw data lake where you store the data set. Then maybe you decide to add annotations. You check out your new branch, add a new tensor that's called labels, append 100 annotations to that, and then maybe you want to update the images. Etc. And then you can commit at every point you did any modification and then run a query, which creates a view of a data set at a specific snapshot. And then you can stream this to, to train on PyTorch or TensorFlow to train your model. Optionally, if you want to make it performant, there's also a materialization step that takes a data set. Maybe you have pointers inside which link to the images, or you have inefficiently represented data. It takes that and makes it in a compact representation so that the streaming itself can be very fast. Once you build your data set, you sometimes want to run queries. This is the part that you want to create a view. Let's say you're looking for edge cases when there is a car that's driving and seeing a bicycle during the raining weather. There's this, we built an extension to SQL, or which we call a tensor query language, which not only just does a simple querying and filtering functionality, but also lets you to operate on top of any dimensional tensors inside the query language itself. So in this example, what you can do directly inside the query engine is actually crop the images, adjust the bounding boxes, and maybe apply a user-defined transformation to sort the images based on the bounding boxes and already previously predicted model that you can then later send this to fine-tuning of your model or maybe re-annotation itself. On top of that, we also built the visualization engine that the same way as can, can stream the data to the training process, can also stream it to your browser, both you can qualitatively and quantitatively visualize the data set itself. And then once you're happy with the subset that you are going to train, then we build one of the fastest data streaming data loaders that helps you to stream the data from object storage to the GPUs as if the data is local to the machine. And we'll see how this is very critical when you're training your own um, large visual models. So one thing that makes it as good as, as if you can look into the benchmarks that we did with AWS team is that it, let's say you're running a training process, you have to copy the data from the storage to the machine. And it usually wastes a couple hours of GPU time before you kickstart the training process. And if you're operating on top of 64, maybe 1,000 GPUs at the same time, then this cost becomes very, very big. 
what we show you here is that we can stream the data as if the data set is local to the machine while taking the data um, remotely instead of reading it uh, from a local um, file system. If you get back, what happening is today is that you have maybe a data set. You want to start exploration on your laptop. You want maybe to create a notebook and then look around. Maybe you have your multi-GPU, multi-node training job that's ready to get started, or maybe an inference job. And you have to copy the data around all these locations before you kickstart any of the processes below. And then let's say your data set has been changed. You have added more data, maybe changed the annotations. There's some life cycle that's happening. You have to go and copy the data around all the time. What we do is that think of it as Netflix for data sets, where your data set actually stored in a centralized location and stream to any endpoint you have whenever you need it. And that's what at core with Act what we are focused on is providing you this capability for your training your language models. And let me show you how would you do with um, Nano GPT. So Nano GPT for your context on your Carpathia build a very simple uh, boilerplate code that can actually run very efficient GPT training on multi GPU setup. Um, the model it's taking is actually GPT two, a pretty fairly small one for demonstrative purposes. And the data set itself is open web text. So what we did is that we actually store the data in US East, spin up a machine on, on US West, and then stream the data from the US East to US West. And you might wonder, why do we need this? So what happened today is actually there is a huge problem with finding the GPUs. Is this, you might sometimes locate the GPUs in US East, US Central, US West, or maybe sometimes in Europe or in Asia. And you have to be very flexible where your data is actually stored so that you can start the kick, kickstart of the training process without wasting all the GPU compute time for moving around the data set itself. So this becomes much more critical at that time. So um, taking the open web text, which is like 9 million documents, um, it has about 9 billion tokens, very small one. Um, what we achieved here is that on a data bottleneck computation, here, keep in mind that the reason why we take this knowledge GPT is that the model is fairly small. So what it really is important is how fast you can stream the data to the GPUs. But once we will see later, as the model becomes bigger, then streaming the data to the GPUs is, be, is less of a bottleneck compared to actually model synchronization across multiple nodes. And here, what we achieve here is that is GPUs are utilized 100%. But that's not the uh, most important uh, metric that you should look into. Actually looking at the energy consumption of the GPU is more important. And you can see sometimes we overclock it um, fairly. Um, I think the goal is to get it as 100% as utilized as much possible. Uh, for information, we have managed to get um, up to 900 uh, megabyte uh, per second, megabit per second uh, data streaming per eight, um, 800 GPU machine. And there's fairly more, much more capacity to get up front there. And um, if you look into, um, compared to what is the theoretical peak limit of B416 computation on those machines, I think we get the same speed as if reading the data from locally memory mod files as um, Carpathia's code is, has been doing, especially what it, it was taking is that taking um, open web text, doing some pre-processing be beforehand, storing that on a local file system in a memory mapped um, arrays that's very fast to stream to the uh, memory and then to the GPUs. And we can get the same performance, but instead of reading it locally from memory mapped files, we now stream the data from remote storage decompress that, apply any transformation, and then feed this into the GPUs. And apparently, you don't need actually uh, many CPU workers per GPU. We show you here, you can do the same thing just with two CPU workers per GPU um, compared to like usually typically you see in the code that sometimes people use um, eight GPUs. And one of the key reasons is that we have re-implemented a data loader in C++ outside of Python to make sure all this process can be as efficient as possible on your machine. So now um, let's get out of the being a data bottleneck computation to actually a model bottleneck computation. So the core of this uh, whole talk is actually focused on how we can train large visual models with Deep Lake. And now we take a um, clip model, which is a text uh, and uh, images model. And um, the goal here is to take a 1 million parameter model, which is fairly okay size, um, and the Lion data set um, to do the training process. So um, if you follow the recent research, there's a new 
VIT, which is a vision transformer that got out uh, with 20, the largest one is 22 billion parameters. So whatever we do here, apply actually to that use case as well. And we'll sh soon um, uh, sh throw an updated demo to the product as well. So what we did here is that if you take line 400, not the 2 billion, um, so you get bigger as well. Just the, like downloading and fetching um, and constructing the asset itself from the internet overall takes about 100 hours. Um, once you get the parquet files, page the data set, a data each file by file, and then maybe you want to shuffle or crop and you do any process processing here. And finally, once you're ready, um, sort the data set on object storage and start doing the training process. So once you did the fetching, actually going into Deep Lake um, format is very straightforward. It just takes about six hours compared to the 100 hours you have already spent. And now any team member of yours can access the data set that's already been processed from any location, um, directly just pointing the data set from the uh, Deep Lake storage. And then you can get started doing the training process. Here in this case, what we found out have been available is actually just 16,800 GPS on US Central. And the data set itself has been stored on US East, again, on AWS. One thing that we do not recommend um, compared to the previous example is that do not um, stream the data from one region to another region, because usually the cloud, they charge um, egress fee. If you store on the Deep Lake um, Active Loop Managed Storage, there's no any egress fee attached to that, but still uh, we'll be um, recommending to stay in the same region as much as possible. Or what we have an additional feature is actually cache the data once once the data set has been streamed from one location to another location. And then if we look into the metrics is that we have been able to get about 80% GPU utilization on 16,800 GPUs while streaming the data and training at the same time with 5,000 images per second and um, overall saving hundreds of hours of saved uh, for copying the data all around the places. And then um, let's say once you have been able to train the model, what, what else? Like you build your own large visual model um, and, and, and the next step is actually start fine tuning on the edge cases. And with our actual solution here, what you can do is um, we built it, um, you can use the TQL, actually start querying the data set um, to fine tune your visual transform model. Here is an example of Coco. This is a fairly straightforward data set you can look into. It has about 100,000 images. What you can do is let's say you want to, it, it has been allocated with bounding boxes and segmentations. And let's say you are training a model that wants to be able to classify if this is a banana or apple. And to be able to do that, you want um, your data loader to actually start sampling the data from Coco that mostly heavily contains banana or apple. Now, or maybe your model has been undersampled before and you need to find these edge cases and, and do that. So we build a, query engine that let, lets you able to run these different types of queries. In this case, this will be also doing a random sampling between sampling bananas and apples at the same time. And let's say I want to be able to have mostly banana, but sometimes an apple data set. So this will actually um, stream the data while you can see that most of the cases are banana. And sometimes like uh, out of um, five out of thousand examples, you will have uh, an apple in the shown. So if we go with uh, one here, so then, then you'll see it most of it, like it's Apple actually. Five out of the um, five out of six images will be an Apple and one uh, will be a banana. And then the key thing here is that you are able to quickly sample your data set, create a view, store the disk view, and then take this ID and then put into um, deep lake data loader, and then very efficiently stream this to the training process and then continuously do this. And we, if we look into the benefits, what this lets you to do is actually build your own data flywheel that helps you to iterate over the cycles as fast as possible while you fine tune your model that gives you the competitive edge over the AI um, revolution that's happening uh, all over the place. So if we go into the benefits, then it first of all provides everyone a single point of view of the data sets that you store as an organization, help you to query um, or curate um, specific samples or edge cases for troubleshooting your uh, model performance. Um, help you to apply, of course, um, just-in-time transformations while you're streaming the data. And um, you are not limited into a specific region no longer. You can actually store the data set in one location. And then once you have an availability of GPU cluster in any um, state, just stream the data there and then do the training process. 
And for large, really large data sets, you're no longer limited to local NVMe storage. You can actually um, use a network or highly utilize it for doing the data prep processing and streaming to the pro um, training part. So in short, what Axelope is focused on providing is a solid data foundation for AI. We help with a simple API for creating, storing, and collaborating on AI data sets at any scale. Um, help you to rapidly transform and stream the data while you are doing the training process, as shown before, and instantly query, version control, explore, and visualize data sets for AI. And the main goal is to free your team to actually building and maintaining this infrastructure yourself to focus on what's the most important thing for the business to actually ship the AI products much faster. And those are the benefits that we have seen while working with our customers is that we help them to reduce the GPU compute cost by not wasting time on data transfer, help you to drive revenue by focusing um, your data scientists on core business problems and also eliminate annual project failure. And all this, we have seen that some companies, they spend orders of tens of millions of dollars internal house building, in-house building of the data infrastructure they have to use where they actually that's not their core part of the business. And they can spend and also use their resources for efficiently shipping these more safely uh, models into the production. Um, that's that's about it. Um, if you're interested, feel free to check out deepleg.ai. We just recently published a um, paper both on academic site and into CIDR, which is a, one of the most prestigious database conferences, and also a white paper for more uh, non-technical reading. Um, let, feel free to join our open source um, and also like our Slack community. And of course, if you're interested, we'd love to um, have a conversation and um, collaborate together. Thank you very much. Um, so we're excited about all the AI industry. Um, thanks a lot.